Uh, let me begin. Good, as I said, good afternoon to all. And uh, tonight, today, we're going to talk about some of the special aspects of teaching technology topics to seniors. And seniors are really going to be different than the other types of students you may come in contact with. Just to give you a little information about my own uh, background from a teaching perspective, uh, I wasn't banking, but uh, when I moved up to this part of Arizona, I decided I would use some of my uh, technology experiences and see if I could teach them at the local community college, Gila Community. So uh, they now have me actually teaching four classes each year at the college. Uh, one called Introduction to Computer-Based Systems, and that's geared to typical college-age students, and embarrassingly for me, uh, more often than not, some of these students have a lot more knowledge about technology than I do. Uh, there's a second class I teach, and that really is geared towards Microsoft Office and working on Word, Excel, and PowerPoint. And uh, this is where the students tend to be either typical college age or seniors who are computer literate. The third group is this, uh, the third, third class rather, is just a short term Windows 10 class that has all ages attending. Last but not least, it's called Computers for Beginners. And that title says it all. And these students are almost always 100% seniors. And so this is the class that, as I kind of explained some of my experiences here, will be what was it was based on. Sooner or later, we are all teachers. Isn't that true in life? Uh, I would bet that since all of you listening are APCUG members and your clubs hold periodic meetings, uh, every time you have a meeting, there's probably some kind of training that goes on either provided by a club officer or a, a member conducting a presentation. And you've learned over time that if the presentation is too technical, uh, it'll most likely be over the head of those in attendance, and the opposite is true as well. If the presentation is too simple, uh, those in attendance that have a fair amount of computer knowledge are gonna be bored. Finding the right balance is the happy medium and certainly the goal to achieve. Often, uh, outside of your user group activities, you're going to find yourself being a teacher. How about uh, a relative who just got a new computer? Every family has a computer expert. And my guess is most of you attending this session are probably the one that's been nominated by your family to be the computer expert. All the questions keep on coming to you anytime, uh, as I said, somebody gets a new computer or they have a problem with an old computer. Friends, and these could be your own friends or these could be your spouses, call you on the phone and with the opening words, I have a quick question for you. And once you hear that, you know what's coming next. And it's not a question that can be answered quickly. Often you may be asked to speak at the local senior center or the library. Uh, this happens once people know you belong to a computer club in town, uh, either as an officer or a member, and that you are a willing volunteer. I did not do this presentation on my own. I did pull a lot of this together, but I went out and I asked others if they might provide, uh, this is other people who are in a teaching profession, if they could provide some input for me. So, uh, as I said, a lot of this is my own experiences, but from the others, these people would be Abby Stokes, uh, author of Is This Thing On? Uh, three folks from the Sarasota Technology Users Group in Florida uh, provided their input. Judy Tellur, who uh, most of you know as probably the best known person within APCUG because she has the contact with practically all of the, the user groups and uh, she's the chair of the advisors. And as I cull together all of the information provided by these various sources, really what came to mind and impressed me was how many of them were the same, that we really focus on same kinds of aspects here and none of us have been met or very few of us have actually ever met and certainly we've not had conversations about this so I guess it just comes naturally that when you're an instructor you look for the things that are going to help get the point across and get your lessons across. 
So let's start with Abby. Uh, Abby Stokes is a longtime friend to APCUG. She's spoken at several of our conferences over the years. Uh, the author of this fantastic book, uh, written with seniors in mind, it was uh, her mom in mind when she wrote the book, Is This Thing On? And uh, if any of you have not visited Abby's website, uh, there it is, askabbystokes.com, and a wealth of information on this website. One of the uh, areas that she lists, in addition to video, training videos and other, other things, is called 10 Tips for Teaching Silver Surfers. And I'm going to go over a few of them that uh, I've also used in my nine years of uh, educating seniors about technology. Now, just as a side note, uh, when I saw the term that Abby used, silver surface, that immediately brought to mind what happened to me at the local casino in my area. I was there not gambling, no, having a meal. And as I was leaving, I said, uh, can I get a senior discount? And I was told, oh, no, we don't offer senior discounts anymore. We now have wisdom discounts. Kind of made my day. So here's Abby's tips for teaching silver surfers, the ones that are uh, common with what I've tried to follow. What turns them on? Uh, that's what she says, and that really means finding out what the student is passionate about. And once a student realizes what's available on the World Wide Web, uh, for what truly interests them, the need to encourage them dramatically decreases. I have a friend named Mike, and Mike, uh, back about 10 years ago, uh, we would be talking about computers, and he was in his late 60s at the time and said, no, Ray, I'm too old to learn about computers. That's uh, something that passed me by, and uh, I just can't remember anything, etc." He went on and on, giving me a list of reasons why he could not learn about computers. And uh, we both had musical interests, and then I started showing him what was available with using his computer for organizing his music collection, uh, how he could make his music collection portable and carry with him in his pocket using uh, an iPod, uh, 5,000 of his favorite songs. Uh, I showed him what was available music-wise on YouTube. Well, today, uh, Mike is now uh, owns three computers. He has uh, the Amazon Echo in his home. Uh, he does carry his iPod with him all the places that he goes. So uh, what changed, Mike? We found something he was passionate about and how that could help him uh, enjoy that activity even more. Conquering the mouse. And... Uh, I've watched newbies and new folks who are working with a computer, and they don't even know how to hold the mouse. I was watching one good friend, a doctor and lawyer, who the first time he in, in, in was entertaining using a mouse was holding it just with two fingers. Uh, you just you don't, don't know. So uh, what I suggest they do when they're, it's new and uh, if they're having some difficulty, I send them to uh, any of the various solitaire computer games. Uh, these actually were developed by Microsoft and other companies to help students learn how to handle the mouse and become more familiar with it. I call it mouse dexterity. And those kind of games also help the student focus on the screen and find things that they're looking for quicker. Uh, I now give homework. I, earlier in my teaching, the beginner's class, I didn't give homework. But now I've learned that if I want the student to practice what they learned in class that day, I have to actually assign it as a homework. And I've learned that seniors can be like their teenage counterparts. An actual assignment will be done long before a suggestion to do the same task is followed. So here's some of the issues to consider when teaching seniors. Uh, sad fact, but many seniors no longer have the memory skills they had when younger. Now, when I make these statements, these are, of course, our generalizations. But uh, it is true that uh, the older we get, the harder it is to retain new information. So uh, what I like to promote is learning by, by repetition or by rote. And I use the example that consider the way most of us learned the multiplication table back in the days when the subject matter was called arithmetic. Uh, with learning how to use computer functions, I think the answer is the same. Practice that particular task over and over until it becomes natural. 
how to foster encouragement to use the computer. And this is what we discussed a, a few minutes ago, but it's worth repeating. Uh, determine what the student is passionate about. Show them what type of information is available on the World Wide Web. And uh, like I did the case with Mike, I create, as his uh, wife said to me, Ray, you've created a monster. Many seniors use the hunt and peck system when typing and really can easily become discouraged once they have an assignment that requires more than a couple of lines to, to type. Well, I encourage them to take college keyboarding classes. Keyboarding is the term of the day. They no longer call typing. Uh, take a keyboarding class, and obviously if they're seniors, it's typically free at most uh, community colleges. And if they don't want to actually go that step, there's a terrific website called Power typing.com free and uh, gives all kinds of typing tests and it teaches a person using it how to do touch typing the better a person can type the more enjoyment they're going to get from their computer some more issues to consider uh, many seniors I found are tentative and, and afraid to just try something to feel they'll break the computer. I can't tell you how many times a student will raise their hand in class and say, Ray, what happens if I do such and such? And my answer is always the same. Try it and let us know. Uh, so I really want to assure my students that today's computers, unlike the ones from 20 years ago where you would get the blue screen of death, uh, that today's computers are almost bulletproof. And that simply using them in a normal manner will not cause any problems. Seniors, and unfortunately I'm going to say mostly the guys, are not the best at taking copious notes. And then when they get home and they're trying to do the assignment they learned in class, they have nothing to, to read from. And uh, they may have forgotten and tend to skip it. So uh, my solution here is... If there's no textbook involved in the class, then I go to the trouble to make handouts. And while it's extra work for me, uh, I just make them once and then I can just use them over and over again at, at future classes just with occasionally some updates. I've learned that seniors like something they can hold in their hand and read. This is why you'll see many seniors perhaps uh, preferring an actual book rather than using a device like a Kindle. The three most important attributes for an instructor when teaching seniors. First one is patience. You need to have the patience of a saint, as people say, and to really uh, not be critical and understand where the student is coming from. The second one is patience, and you guessed it, the third one is patience. Just like uh, real estate, location, 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 teaching seniors have patience. This little guy in the cartoon, uh, on the picture rather, uh, he seems like he's running out of patience. Some other attributes. The KISS method. Uh, I actually thought that term came out of uh, the political elections back in the 90s, but no, nope, uh, keep it simple, stupid. It was a design principle developed by the Navy way back in 1960. And it tells us, you know, talk in plain English. When using a computer term for the first time, you know, give an explanation that's really easy to understand. Always encourage questions. Uh, I will stop after making uh, talking for a while and say, uh, are there any questions? And by doing that, usually I can drag some people out with us. Oh, well, okay, okay. And they were hesitant. And I emphasize at the time, you know, the no dumb questions and that you're asking a question that probably other people in the room have the same questions but were hesitant about raising their hand. So encourage questions. Where and when possible, use some type of presentation software like PowerPoint, because we all like visuals. Uh, here's an example that I use in my beginner's class when I'm talking about the, the cloud, because the, they hear the term the cloud all the time, and you know, what is that? Is, it really, is there really some cloud up there in the sky? So I show pictures of, of an actual server building, 
and then uh, what and it, a typical floor would look like inside with uh, hard drive after hard drive after hard drive just going almost as far as the eye can see. And then this helps the student visualize, oh, the cloud, it really isn't a white cloud up in the sky. It's a location that stores data. So PowerPoint, uh, anything visual comes in very, very handy. Encourage use of YouTube. Definitely YouTube has become the go-to website for training videos. Uh, practically any topic you can think of, uh, you're going to find somebody wanting to tell you all about it on YouTube. And computer learning is right there, very high on the list. But when we go to YouTube, I tell my students, you know, just keep this in mind. Uh, when you want to find something, just type the words that, you, that come to mind in the YouTube search box. And you're going to be brought to not one, not two, but dozens of videos that relate to that. And the, some of the negatives of YouTube is check the date that the video was uploaded, uh, particularly with computer training. Uh, I've seen within you know, the last weeks looking for something on uh, YouTube and getting a video that is talking about Windows XP or Vista that are no longer supported. So I always tell my students, look at the date the video was uploaded to make sure that it's relevant and current. And understand that the videos are uploaded from all over the world. And sometimes uh, the people who are speaking uh, could be very, very knowledgeable, but English is their second language, and they're not as easy to understand. And the, there is no law that says you must watch the entire YouTube video. If you are finding any kind of difficulty with it, just stop it and go on to the next one. Make your class fun. Uh, show some comical computer-related cartoons now and then, just to kind of you know, break the ice, get a little uh, a, a comedy going there, and uh, you'd be surprised how all of a sudden this you know grabs people's attention. They start uh, watching you more attentively, hoping there'll be more cartoons. Another way to make your class fun is uh, to tell some corny computer jokes. And the good news about telling these jokes is that nobody's going anywhere. You have a, a, uh, an office that's a captive audience, and uh, they're going to have to listen no matter how bad the jokes are. So there's, you know, what did the spider do on the computer? Made a website. What did the computer do at lunchtime? Had a bite. And a baby computer calls his father data. Oh, these are pretty bad. I agree. I uh, give these courtesies of that website, ducksters.com. So this was not a, a long uh, video. I went through it a little bit faster than I thought, uh, but I think I covered all the aspects that were necessary, and I knew that since this was the, uh, the last one of the day, I could probably lend, uh, end a little bit early, and uh, nobody would be too uh, upset about that. So, uh, David, if you're still there, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, David? Yeah, I've unmuted myself. Good. Okay, uh, so far, I mean, feel free to, uh, to you know, to type in some questions while we're doing this. Uh, uh, somebody said workshops are almost impossible. Any suggestions? Uh, when they say work, they, I'm not quite sure what, is, what makes it impossible. Uh, sometimes with a workshop, you're going to have varying degrees of uh, computer knowledge. And that, that does make it difficult, and it goes back to the slide where I said if it's too simple, people are going to get bored. If it's too complicated, people are going to be intimidated. So uh, it's, uh, you got to focus your attention and, and what you're trying to teach at a middle level, knowing that you might get some folks on either end of that spectrum uh, to lose a little bit of interest, but if you can focus on the majority of people, then I think you'll do all right. Okay, then we got a question in here about developing listening skills when teaching. Uh, 
you know, you, you, the, what I would tell my, my students is to just, you know, focus what I'm on saying. And if there was something that wasn't clear, ask me to repeat it. I, I never have a problem of repeating something two, three, four times, whatever it's going to take to make the person under, understand and know what, what we're talking about. Uh, and But I do understand this listener's question about listening skills. I can tell you what happens with frequency where I will be talking for five minutes on a computer-related topic, and then I move on to something else, and with a minute I get a question from somebody that if they would have been listening to what I said a few minutes earlier, knew I covered that. So yes, listening skills can be important, and it's just a matter of uh, focusing and re-emphasizing that the point you're trying to make. Okay. Uh, we're getting a lot of <clears throat> different comments in here <clears throat> talking about repeating stuff. How many times would you say you need to repeat it? Well, and that will vary on the, on the com complexity of it. Uh, what I will try to do if I'm covering a particular topic of the day is I will cover it, move on to something else, and then maybe a half an hour later. My classes run uh, for almost three hours. Uh, they're two, about two, two hours and 40 minutes with two breaks. So I could talk about something in the early part of that class, move on to something else, and then come back and repeat it an hour later. And uh, I find that to be a little bit more useful than trying to, to go over it and again and again. Because as said earlier, the people who did understand it are going to be a little bit bored. But if it comes back as a topic later in the session, then it doesn't seem like I'm repeating it for their benefit. Okay. Another one says, uh, do you find any usefulness out of giving them topics or a project to do on their own during class and then walking around and, and answering individual questions while they're trying to do that. Not that in the, sense? yeah, uh, good, very good question. Not in the beginner's class. Uh, the, the beginner's class, uh, I, I should take that back. When we're doing basic email and surfing the web, Yes, those are the tasks that they're given uh, for email. I'll have an example of a, of a two or three paragraph message on the screen in front and then ask them to type that with whatever uh, spaces are involved and paragraph mark, uh, spaces between paragraphs. So, so those kind of assignments I do. But unless I have an actual textbook in the class, it's really hard to assign a, a project to do. Okay. And another question is, how do you find the topics week after week to talk about? If it's the beginner's class, it's um, pretty basic. It's the ones that I've been teaching over and over for the nine years, except I've, uh, I keep on upgrading them with based on what's happened. So uh, when I started teaching email, I really was just focusing on the use of uh, web-based email. But now, with uh, the since Windows 10 has come out and the Windows Mail program within Windows 10 is pretty relatively easy to use, I now incorporate using email clients like Windows Mail. So it's the same topics, but I add to them what has uh, become more the more modern or better ways to accomplish things. Okay, but if I understand correctly, that the the topic and course curriculum are somewhat set when you uh, are teaching the class. So when they when they sign up for the class, they know sort of what it's supposed to be taught, right? Yes, there there is a course catalog from the uh, we, we're, uh, we work with Eastern Arizona College, and there's a course catalog, and they specify all the things that must be covered in the class. I've always found that uh, I can accomplish that, plus add other aspects like, uh, you know, photos are always a very big topic. How do I get them off my phone and onto the computer? And how do I manipulate them? And how do I make it easy to share them? Uh, I, I add music, things like that to the, to, again, again, to find what people are really interested in. Uh, email and surfing the web are wonderful, and uh, you want to make sure everybody knows that. But there's so much more 
that the computer can really uh, improve a person's uh, lifestyle by finding things they enjoy. Uh, I try to add them to the to my uh, course description as well. Okay, what age group do you like teaching the most? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, well, I'll, I'll go back and add. What age group do you dislike? Not really dislike, <laughs> but don't like teaching the most. You know, it's it's all about people, not about age groups. And I have uh, people who are, as I said, typical college age students in my computer uh, introduction to computer based systems class. Uh, that one is a class that uses a program called SimNet. And it's where the students really are online all the time learning, and I'm just there to answer questions that they, they don't understand and occasionally to give presentations on computer concept topics. That class, I like some of those students a lot. Uh, they'll stay after class just to chat with me. I find uh, that the younger ones who think they know everything uh, give me the opportunity to talk about old stuff. Perfect example is uh, with my younger students, I'll say, who can tell me what Y2K means? And amazing how few of them have ever heard of Y2K and have no idea what took place on December 31, 1999. So we'll go in and we'll talk about that for a while. So I enjoy those students. And then I also enjoy the senior citizens when uh, I watch their eyes open up and I'll make a point about something and they'll say, I didn't know you could do that. Or I've always been wondering about that. So it really doesn't, you know, the to answer the question is not so much the age group, it's the individual people. Okay. Um, okay. Do, 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 do. So your, your students range from college age to seniors, right? Uh, my oldest student was 87. Okay. And my youngest was 19. Okay. Um, okay. Do you like teaching from a book or from the handouts? Uh, I, again, depending on the class. So on the class that's Microsoft Office, I definitely like teaching from the book because the book that we use is called Go with Microsoft Office 2016. Uh, it, it gives uh, very good detailed examples of what the student needs to do. And then uh, when we get to the projects, uh, each one is a little bit harder with less and less direct instruction and more expecting the student to remember. So I, I do like that book and I like using a book in that class. But uh, I've tried using some books in the beginner's class that I've come up with and none of them seem to work. I've found over time now that it's better if I give handouts and we use the handouts as my direction. And then all I need to do at the beginning of each semester is look at the handouts and see if they need to be updated for, for changes that may have taken place over the last year. So it depends on the class, and I use both. Okay. <clears throat> okay, anybody else have any questions? Okay. Uh, okay, someone says, what's your ratio of your talking versus having the students talking? Well, I'm from New York, so I talk a lot, uh, but uh, it's hard for me to come up with an actual number. I think I'm doing most of the dialogue until I start asking my students questions about what we've covered just to make sure that they're retaining it. So if I had to come up with a number, it's probably 95% me, 5% my students. Okay. Okay. And I assume it's based on the topic as to whether they're hands-on or they're just taking notes. Uh, all of the students in our computer lab sit in front of a very nice modern uh, computer, all-in-one computers uh, with pretty high specs. And uh, so in the beginning of a session, I'm doing more of the talking, but as we get into the project, then they're following me by looking at the uh, the it's not a whiteboard, but it's a, a, a screen in the front. I'm using PowerPoint or just uh, showing them on my teacher's computer what they need to be doing on their own. So it is mostly hands-on. Okay. Okay, anybody else got any suggestions, questions? Okay. 
Oh, someone asked to use Chromecast. No, uh, not in the college. Uh, we have to use the equipment that they provide. Okay. Because I assume this is all hardwired and. Yes. Okay. Even when we do sessions at my local uh, computer club, which I've changed it over to a meetup club in, during the last two years, uh, we do have our own projector that we set up, and uh, the library where we hold our meetings has a screen. So uh, you know, it's it's all as I said, hot wide. We don't need to use uh, things, uh, options like Chromecast and some of the others that are available. <laughs> 